So the last thing we talked about was the ATP cycle, this regeneration of ATP using energy from catabolic reactions to make more of that energy rich molecule so that the cell can use it to drive cellular work. Now, we've been stressing that when you break ATP, this is an exergonic process, it releases energy that the cell can then use. If it's an exergonic process, is it spontaneous? I'm hoping you said yes, right? Because remember, spontaneous processes have a negative delta G, they release energy, they do not require any input of energy to get them going. So if hydrolysis of ATP is a spontaneous process, why doesn't all of the ATP in the cell just spontaneously break apart, right? That would kind of make sense, because if the cell doesn't need to add its own energy to break the ATP, why doesn't it just all fall apart? You know, that would be, I mean, it's a good thing it doesn't happen, right? Because that would be bad for the cell if it all just fell apart as soon as it was made and the cell couldn't use that energy that was released. So there's gotta be a reason why um, ATP doesn't just fall apart on its own. So let's take a look at something that's called the energy of activation. So just rewind just a little bit. We're going to go back to this idea of chemical reactions. Remember that every chemical reaction between molecules involves breaking some bonds and making some bonds as well, right, as you rearrange atoms. And for every single chemical reaction, does not matter whether it's endergonic or exergonic, there needs to be an initial amount of energy needed to start this reaction. And this energy is called the free energy of activation or activation energy, or you can abbreviate as E sub A. It all means the same thing, this initial amount of energy that's needed for a reaction to take place. Now, this activation energy is usually supplied in the form of thermal energy, of movement of these cells, as the reactant molecules absorb this energy from their surroundings. So, yeah, uh, Energy of activation is hard to think about. We've talked about lots of different kinds of energy, right? We talked about the free energy that molecules have based on their structure. This is chemical or potential energy. This is different from that kind of energy. This is going to be energy that molecules have not based on their structure, but based on their vibration or that random movement, right? So think about it. If you've got one reactant here and one reactant here, and they're just vibrating a little bit, right, they're probably not going to have enough of that thermal energy to actually react with each other to be converted into products. But if you have these reactants that are moving a lot, have a lot of thermal energy, right, have enough of that energy of activation to slam into each other, they're probably going to have enough of that energy to react to become the products at the end of the chemical reaction. So let's take a look at this particular graph. And now this graph is exactly the same as the exergonic reaction graph we looked at earlier, but it has a few slightly different pieces. Um, let's pick it apart. So on the x-axis, here we have time or progress of reaction. So we start with the reactants on the left and then we move towards the products on the right. The y-axis, again, just like before, shows you free energy. So the higher up on the, on the y-axis you go, the more free energy the system has. And so we're going to start out with reactants A, B, and C, D. And what we want to do as part of this chemical reaction is we want to break the bond here between A, B, and the bond here between C, D, and reform bonds instead now between A and C, and B and D. As we look at this, right, the reactants here have this much free energy when the chemical reaction starts. And then the products have far less free energy at the end of the chemical reaction. This difference, that change in free energy between where you start, the reactants, and where you end up, the products, that's our delta G, right? We talked about this in earlier videos. So the delta G in this case is going to be less than zero or negative. This indicates this is an exergonic reaction, right? You start out with reactants with a lot of energy and with products with less energy, energy had to have been released. That should all be review. What we're going to look at now is this hump right here. 
This is the energy of activation. This is, this is the amount of energy that the reactants here need to absorb from their surroundings in the form of that thermal energy to reach a transition state where the bonds here in these original reactant molecules are strained. The bonds there, <clears throat> as they're strained, will be easier to break. As soon as they break, we can continue on with the rest of the chemical reaction to form the products. So you'll notice this, that this energy of activation is energy that needs to be absorbed by the system that's on top of the energy, the free energy that the reactants already have based on their chemical structure. Now, I like to think of this whole process here for this exergonic reaction kind of like a game at the, at the carnival, right? I'm sure you're familiar with that carnival game where you have the big base and it's connected to a tall tower and the tower up at the top is a bell and you want to hit the base with a big hammer or mallet to send a little ball up to the top to ring the bell. If you hit it hard enough, the ball will make it all the way to the top, ring the bell, and you win a prize. Now, on the other hand, if you don't have enough energy when you're swinging the hammer or the mallet, the ball might just go up a little bit, but not have enough energy to go all the way to the top, you're not gonna ring the bell, you're not gonna win the prize. Kind of the same idea. If these reactants absorb a little bit of that thermal energy to get maybe up to here, that's great and all, but it's not enough of the energy to go all the way to the top to ring the bell and win the prize, and so the reactants will stay reactants and that chemical reaction does not take place. If the reactants, however, do swing that hammer really hard or absorb enough of that thermal energy to reach that transition state, that means they send the ball all the way up to the top, they ring the bell, they win the prize. They reach that transition state, the bonds are unstable, they break so that you can form now the new product molecules. So the reason why ATP does not just simply fall apart inside the cell Right, go through that exergonic process that is hydrolysis of ATP is because on their own ATP molecules never absorb enough of that thermal energy to reach the transition state so the bond gets broken. Okay, so I guess that's a good thing, right? This is one reason why ATP doesn't just fall apart in the cell. But the cell still needs to use that ATP and the energy that's stored in the ATP to drive cellular work. So how does the cell get the ATP to reach that transition state so we can hydrolyze it and form ADP and the inorganic phosphate and release energy to do work? Here is where we get a chance to talk about catalysts. So what the cells do is they will use a catalyst to help speed up the reaction that is ATP hydrolysis so that the energy can be released to do cellular work. So a catalyst is described as a chemical agent that speeds up a reaction without itself actually being consumed or changed in any way by the, by the actual chemical reaction. And typically what cells will use as a catalyst are molecules that are called enzymes. Most frequently these enzymes are going to be proteins. There are exceptions to the rule. There are some catalytic RNAs that cells use, but for the most part, enzymes are going to be catalytic proteins. Let's take a look at one example that's shown here on this slide of a chemical reaction that is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. So here we have sucrose and water as our reactants. Sucrose is a disaccharide. It's made out of one glucose and one fructose molecule stuck together using a glycosidic linkage. If the cell wants to use the glucose and the fructose here in the sucrose as a form of energy or maybe building material, it needs to break that glycosidic linkage here. And so if you were to take water right here, one of the reactants, and add sugar to it, sucrose, um, and mix it in a beaker and just let it sit, eventually, maybe after weeks, months, years, eventually all that sucrose on its own would actually degrade down to glucose and fructose. So this is an exergonic or a spontaneous process. However, the cell's not going to wait a year for a sucrose molecule to fall apart. It's like, no, 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 I want this fuel now, give it to me now, right? So what the cell is going to do is it's going to use an enzyme to catalyze or to speed up this reaction. This enzyme is called sucrase. Be careful, sucrase looks a lot like sucrose, right? Sugars usually have the ending O-S-E, 
enzymes very typically will have the ending A-S-E. So just a hint, hint, if you come across a word, never seen it before, have no idea what it means, but it ends in A-S-E, you do know something about that particular substance. That's going to be an enzyme. So this sucrase, what it does is it speeds up the chemical reaction of uh, cutting or hydrolyzing sucrose into glucose and fructose. If we go back to our beaker of sugar water, if I were just to add, you know, two, three, four molecules of sucrase to this beaker of water, within a matter of minutes, all of that sucrose would be degraded down to glucose and fructose. All right. So next step is to talk about, well, how is it that enzymes speed up these chemical reactions? What do they do um, to, to make it more easy for that chemical reaction to take place within a cell? What enzymes do is they will lower that energy of activation barrier that we just talked about, right? So they decrease this need for this extra energy for the reactants to absorb to get the reaction going. Really, really important though. Enzymes, while they do change the energy of activation requirements, they do not touch the delta G of the system, right? It's in red, it's in bold, and it's underlined on this slide. Enzymes do not affect the change in free energy or the delta G. So for example, an enzyme cannot take an endergonic reaction and make it exergonic. That's not going to work. All that the enzyme does is just hasten a reaction that would eventually occur probably on its own. All right, so let's take a look at the same graph that we looked at earlier um, when we were discussing this energy of activation barrier. Uh, the only difference here is we've taken away the actual molecules for the reactants and products, and we've put in two paths that this reaction can take. One path is in the absence of the enzyme, and one path is in the presence of the enzyme. So again, progress of reaction, or time, on the x-axis, and free energy amount on the y-axis. The original reaction we looked at follows the black line, right? So to get from these reactants here with a lot of energy to the products with less energy, the reactants have to absorb this much, all the way up to here, of this energy of activation, this thermal energy, to strain the bonds and to allow the bonds to break so you can reform the products. That's a lot of energy to absorb, right? And so if the cell wants to speed up the chemical reaction, it can add an enzyme. And what the enzyme does is it decreases this energy of activation requirement. So in the presence of the enzyme, the reactants only need to absorb this much energy, about half in this example, to reach that transition state so that the products can be formed. You'll notice that the enzyme did not touch the delta G, right? Reactants still start with the same amount of free energy and the products end up with the same amount of free energy. This is untouched. The enzyme only affects that energy of activation.